So without further ado, I'm going to be turning it over to Jack and Hannah to learn more about how we can all create more sustainable landscaping at home. Thank you so much, Kenny. So howdy, y'all. Um, I'm going to be talking a bit tonight about the why, and then I'll turn it over to Jack more about the how. Um, you can go ahead and advance to the next slide, Kenny. So in the U.S., our largest crop is lawns, taking up an area about three times the total size of all cornfields in production in the country. Take a moment to let that sink in. Lawn grasses are typically invasive species like turf grass. They grow as monocultures with little benefit to wildlife as either habitat or food. Uh, they do little for the health of the soil. They guzzle water and fuel. And conventional maintenance often requires chemicals like herbicides and fertilizers on an all too regular basis. So basically for so long, our yards have had one main goal to look pretty. But what if we could ask more of our landscaping? The biggest threat facing biodiversity today is habitat loss. And we can't fix this just by preserving the remaining wild areas because there's just not enough wilderness left. Um, but perhaps we could stitch back together our landscapes for wildlife, at least some wildlife of the smaller variety. We're not looking for grizzly bears in our backyard. Um, by creating pockets of habitats within the spaces that we each have control over, our lawns. But to do that, we need native plants. So what is a native plant and why does it matter? A native plant is one that is naturally occurring in an area and has been so for a period of time long enough to develop what are called co-evolutionary relationships with other members of the ecosystem. More on that in a minute. A non-native plant is one which did not originate in the ecosystem. You often hear them called escaped or established or even naturalized, but until they've existed in an area long enough to develop those relationships with other members of the ecosystem, they aren't really productive members of society, so to speak. And then compared to non-natives, invasive plants are those that specifically crowd out, over predate, or otherwise harm native populations of plants and animals, or they might impede agriculture or harm human health. So those are the ones that we deem invasive. So it's pretty clear what the issue with invasive plants are, right? It's right in the definition, the difference is the damage. But what does it matter if we have native or non-native species if they're not obviously harmful? It turns out, at least in the eyes of insects, not all plants are equal. So if you go back to that definition of native plants, the difference is the amount of time they've been part of the ecosystem, right? Ecosystems are made up of species that have influenced each other over thousands of generations, many thousands of years. And this has caused them to develop relationships that we know as plant and herbivore, right? And predator, flower and pollinator. Um, and these co-evolutionary relationships can be very specific. In some cases, specialisms that are so specific that if you lose one member of the partnership, you lose the other. And this is because they've adapted so closely to their partner species or group of species that they put energy into physical or chemical or behavioral adaptations to be super good at that one thing, um, but they just can't simply choose to switch to a different uh, food source, for example. Um, not without many generations of evolution. So for plants and insects, time really matters. And without insects, we don't eat. One out of every three bites of food that we eat relies on pollinators like bees, butterflies, and beetles. Um, and often when we think about pollinators, save the bees, right? We could just put a beehive out. Um, but in the United States, at least, honeybees are to pollination what chickens are to songbirds. They're livestock. Honeybees are non-native generalists, and while they're an important part of our agricultural system as currently managed, they are not the be-all, end-all, so to speak. Uh -huh. There are actually about 4,000 species of bees that are native to the United States that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, about 45% of these native bees are pollen specialists, meaning they use only pollen from one type of plant. And if that plant is removed, the bee goes away. If the bees are removed, the plant doesn't reproduce. So 
Uh, it also turns out native bees tend to be a lot better, effective, efficient pollinators than honeybees. Honeybees aren't in it for the pollen, they're in it for the nectar and they happen to pick up the pollen um, and move it to other flowers along the way uh, and do a little bit uh, with eating it. But native bees tend to be focused on moving that pollen back to their nest because that's their main food source. Um, and again, onto other flowers in the process. Uh, so since they're so specialized on pollen, some studies show that they're two to three times better at pollinating the plants that they pollinate. So we need native plants to support native bees. And adult butterflies are pollinators as well, most being generalists feeding on nectar from a large range of flowers. But it's the caterpillars that often get overlooked in their contribution to ecosystem. Without caterpillars, our birds don't eat, or more specifically, baby birds don't eat. So during the breeding season, most songbirds, upwards of like 96% of songbird species, forage almost exclusively on caterpillars to feed their growing nestlings. They need caterpillars as a rich source of fat and protein and nutrients um, so that their young can grow fast and get out of the nest. And seeds just won't cut it. Um, bird, uh, most songbird species do not feed their young seeds. Studies have found, for example, that one pair of Carolina chickadees can feed a single brood, a single nest content of babies, um, up to 9,000 caterpillars before they leave the nest. That's 9,000 caterpillars over a couple of weeks just for one nest uh, brood. And they're more likely to feed their young native caterpillars since non-natives might have chemical defenses that the birds aren't dealing with. And baby birds aren't the only fussy eaters. Most native caterpillars are also adapted to feeding on a single species or genus of plants because coevolution, there it is again, has specialized them to withstand chemicals produced by the plant for defense. You probably know the most widely known example of this is monarch caterpillars on milkweed, right? Um, monarch butterfly caterpillars are only able to eat milkweed leaves as they grow. They're adapted to withstand this toxin called cardiac glycosides. Um, the plant produces it actually as a defense against predation, but the caterpillars are adapted um, to it and even use it to protect themselves from predation. But what's less known is that most caterpillars have this type of specialist relationship with a host plant or group of plants. And if we lose those native host plants, we lose the caterpillars. If we lose the caterpillars, we lose the songbirds. So while a butterfly bush sounds like an excellent choice to support butterflies in your landscape, and will actually attract some generalist adult butterflies to use its nectar. It's simply useless to the remainder of the butterfly life cycle here in the United States because it's not native to our country. Um, our butterflies need native plants. So what if we took some of that space and time and energy that we put into manicuring our lawns and put it into native plantings instead? What might that look like? There are a lot of alternatives to traditional lawns that can help meet our goals of increasing wildlife habitat, also lowering fuel, water, and chemical use, but there are some options and trade-offs. First of all, it's really intimidating to start. Um, growing a greener yard can be as small as a container or bed planting or as large as converting your entire yard into a meadow, um, but it doesn't need to be all or nothing. Um, whatever small step you can do to start is important. Even small pockets of habitat embedded in a network of other small pockets throughout, hopefully, your neighborhood can make a big difference to wildlife like our native insects and songbirds. And Jack will talk a bit more about how to kind of choose what's right for your yard in a little bit. Another question is how native is native? We have these options of, oh, right, what's a native plant? What's a cultivar? What's a nativar? Um, and those can be uh, really overwhelming topics at first. Um, but the basic line is that any natives are better than none. And especially if they're replacing invasive plants in your landscape, get those invasives out of there um, and hopefully put natives in their place. It's not realistic to think you'll ever have 100% native plants on your property, nor do you need to. If you're looking for a goal to aim for, 
Um, some studies have shown that birds like black capped chickadees, for example, can only successfully raise young in landscapes with 70% native plants, but that includes trees. Don't forget trees and bushes in your plantings. Native oaks, cherries, and willows host hundreds of species of caterpillars that songbirds can feed their babies. Uh, some people are concerned, do I need chemicals to keep the, the invasive plants out? Um, well, chemicals like herbicides and fertilizers are useful tools in our landscaping toolbox, but ones that should be carefully considered. You gotta treat them with respect. And again, Jack's gonna give us more of the lowdown on that in a little bit. And then how expensive, how much is this gonna cost me to convert my lawn? Um, and again, this depends on the scale of the planting that you undertake. Luckily, native plant nurseries and landscaping companies are becoming more common across the United States. We have several in our um, region here around the Shenandoah Valley area. Um, so they're great places to support, great experts to bring in, um, to consult on your um, area. And there are also places to purchase native seeds online. Growing your own could be a more affordable option um, than buying direct from a nursery. And I'll tell you one method that could help you um, grow some from seeds in a little bit. Maintenance is another one. You know, hopefully you're reducing the amount of mowing, watering, um, fertilizer that you need when you shrink your lawn, but it's not the same as the no mow may challenge. You're not just gonna stop mowing entirely right off the bat um, and let everything grow wild and expect a beautiful functional native meadow to pop up out of nowhere. Uh, it doesn't work that way. A lot of the effort is front loaded in removing that turf grass, getting your plantings established, but if you choose the right plants, once they are established, they should use less maintenance, less water, um, less time than the others. And there are definitely trade-offs with um, how human user friendly, depending on what your goals are. Um, a native meadow is not the same as uh, a flat grass lawn for kids running or dogs running through. Um, there are also concerns about complaints from homeowner, homeowner associations or city regulations. Um, so these are issues that can crop up, but can also be mitigated with careful planning. So again, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And Jack's going to um, touch on some of these subjects in a minute. So we are here tonight to tell you that converting your lawn to native plants is the easiest thing you'll ever do. But you can take hope from our Making Trash Bloom project. Um, here at Sustainability Matters, this is one of our flagship projects, and its goal is to plant native meadow communities on closed landfill cells instead of invasive grasses. So you probably know, or maybe you've never thought about it, but every community in the United States has a landfill, right? We all make trash, and landfills have that daunting, often thankful, thankless task of hiding it away and keeping us safe from it forever, and they've got limited budgeting and staffing and you know, it's just kind of a thankless job. Once a landfill is full of our trash and closed, it's essentially dead space, this mountain of trash, buried, sealed, and pretty much undevelopable. You can't really build on it uh, forever, basically. So Making Trash Bloom uh, aims to reclaim this dead land and restore it to native plant species to better support local insects and birds and wildlife. And Sustainability Matters is well on our way to doing just that with experimental plots at three Virginia landfills. So Shenandoah County Landfill, Rappahannock County Landfill, and the Fairfax County I-66 transfer station. So uh, woot woot if that's in your backyard, uh, good on your community for getting involved. But it hasn't been easy going. Uh, but let me tell you, if we can establish native plants at a landfill where the soil is basically just compacted clay, and there's almost no maintenance to nurture those little native plants along, um, then we pretty much guarantee that you can do it in your yard. <laughs> if we can do it there, you can do it anywhere. Um, so I'll turn it over to Jack now to tell you more about the how. Sure, thanks Hannah. Um, so I'm Jack Bonstead. Um, I've been working on, uh, I work at Blandy Experimental Farm and take care of their native plant trail. And so I, um, have a lot of experience just kind of creating native uh, plant habitat. I do it in my own yard. I do it as a job. I do it for fun. It's just, I, I love, I love this stuff. I love talking native plants and I love talking about how to, um, you know, 
um, convert spaces into to native plants and, and other um, more ecologically friendly options than just having green grass um, in your yard. As Hannah mentioned, uh, grass is woefully ecologically inert. Um, so I'm going to run you through some options um, that you potentially might consider for replacing um, your lawn and also run you through um, how you might actually go out and do that. And then at the end, we'll try to leave a good portion of time for question and answer. Happy to answer all your questions. Love, love talking about this stuff. Um, so first question here, how much lawn should you convert? Um, this is a really good question. This is something you really want to keep in mind when you're, when you're thinking about this is how much land can you handle? Um, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, some people don't want any grass at all. They don't want to mow. They want to have a lawn that is completely made up of native plants, maybe, maybe native plants that they can walk over that's going to require very minimal maintenance. They want to get rid of all their lawn and totally redo it, um, which is cool. We'll talk about that a little bit and what options you have for that. Um, and then there's another option, which is very common. And what really I'm mostly doing in my own yard is gradually converting patches of your yard to native plantings. So um, there's this idea where you can keep patches of grass. I mean, listen, grass is functional. It's easy to maintain. You know, you just, just mow it. That's really all it requires. Um, well, some people like to put a lot of stuff in their grass, but really all you need to do is mow your grass. Um, so you can keep a small patch of grass, you know, you can run out there, you know, run, run your dogs around out there, um, have a spot to sit outside, and then just, you know, around the margins of your lawn, places that you don't, you're not walking every day, um, consider converting those over to native plant beds, you know, like let's, let's get a little wild in those spaces, put some trees in, put some shrubs in, put some, some beautiful wildflowers like you can see in this photo here. Um, Doing things like that can be really, really helpful and really rewarding too. Um, we also mentioned homegrown national park here on the bottom here. Someone I saw someone in the chat earlier talking about Doug Tallamy. He's great. He uh, he has a book called uh, Nature's Best Hope, where he talks about this concept. Um, and the idea is that if everybody pitches in and converts little patches of their lawn or little spaces in their own property um, into sort of this sort of um, native plant habitat um, patches, whether it be meadows, whether it be forest patches, or whatever. Um, you know, all that land together can, can equal the size of a national park or more. So there's actually, if you Google homegrown national park, there's a map and you can add your square footage of your little native wildflower patch onto it and kind of become a part of that whole movement. So that's really cool. Definitely recommend checking that out. Um, if you have time, um, so we can go on to the next slide here. Um, so the idea is we're starting here with lawn. How do we get rid of the lawn? How do we get something else in? The first thing you're going to need to do most of the time, is kill your grass. Um, so the question is, how do you do that? Um, I think going into it, the first thing you want to keep in mind is you need to have a plan for after you kill it. You don't want to just willy-nilly kill off all your grass, then let it go and see what's going to happen, because chances are you're probably going to get a lot of invasive species or more grass or other things you don't want coming up there. So you're going to want to have a plan for what you're going to want to plant in the spots that you kill. Um, also you want to think a lot about timing. So, um, there's a lot of different methods, um, for killing grass. Um, but you want to make sure you're doing it at the right time. You know, if you're going to be doing herbicide, you want to apply it while the herbicide is going to be the most effective. Um, if you want to kill the grass by smothering it, which is a great ecologically friendly option, doesn't require any chemicals. Um, you know, you have to keep in mind how long that's going to take. You're going to have to think about when you're going to want to plant how long you're going to need as lead up time to prepare the site to get rid of all the all the plants you don't want. Um, so these are things that we'll have to keep in mind and we'll, we'll talk about more here as we go forward. Um, all right, so some mechanical methods here. Um, first one is to just dig, strip it, till it, basically mechanically remove the grass that's there. Um, there are ways that you can use a sod cutter, just usually the best little tool you can rent from Home Depot or whatever. Um, it'll slice up the grass. It'll You can literally roll the grass off of your lawn. Um, and that can be very helpful. Um, you can use things like tilling. Um, you can even just go out there if it's a small patch, and I have done this in the small patch in, in my own yard, um, is you can just go out there with a shovel and just dig up the dig up the grass, chop it up real good, flip it over. Um, and that can be enough in some cases um, to create enough space to start establishing your, your, your native gardens um, or your alternative ground cover there. 
Um, one downside of doing that is it does expose the existing seed bank. So uh, when you when you trail up the ground like that, um, well, that, that I shouldn't say it's necessarily a downside. I think in a lot of places where people tend to live, um, it is a downside because a lot of what is in the existing seed bank, which is like the seeds that are just buried in the ground underneath your grass, um, unfortunately tends to be a lot of agricultural weeds, um, really weedy non-native species that you maybe don't necessarily want. Sometimes you can get lucky and you can, you know, till up your ground, you'll get a bunch of native plants coming up. Um, but I would say that is not as common um, for most people. Um, another option, uh, mechanical option that doesn't require any chemicals is solarizing. Um, so solarizing is a really cool way where you basically just cook the grass. Um, so what you'll do with that is you'll get plastic to put on the ground. And an important thing to mention here is it has to be clear plastic. A lot of people think, so in this picture, they're using um, black plastic. And the black plastic can work for just smothering the grass, um, which is just cut, killing it by cutting off light for a very long time. But to solarize it, um, you're actually cooking the grass. So you need things that's going to allow light in and trap the heat in. So you want to have clear plastic. You put it totally down on, the, you cover the site that you want to, that you want to um, solarize. Make sure the edges, you know, there's not air escaping from the edges. You know, they, they just have to be totally weighed down all the way around. Um, and then do it in the middle of summer. So if you do this by this method, um, you know, say you put it out there in July, it could be July or August. Take you six to eight weeks, you could have everything there dead. Does not take very long, um, sometimes even less than that. The other nice thing about this method is it, is it really does kill basically all the weed seeds um, that are in that top layer of soil anyway. Um, it kills the roots. It's a very effective method of, of getting rid of, of lawn. Um, another, another method, which is basically just, um, the method I mentioned before is smothering it. Um, they call it the lasagna method here, which is kind of fun. And that's where basically you put down a layer of cardboard or any other sort of biodegradable, um, material cardboard's usually the easiest thing to come by. So that's a fine thing to use. Um, and then you can layer some com compostable materials in there. So maybe you have a compost pile or something going on, or maybe some wood chips or something you can put over top of that. And then, um, you know, you just basically let that sit. So you're going to let that sit for, it's going to take longer. So solarizing, you can kill everything there in like a month. Um, if you want to use this method, it's usually going to take you closer to six months to do. So you want to plan ahead if you're doing this. Um, so if you start it in the spring, it's probably going to be ready to plant by the fall. Um, you know, there's a lot of different timings you can do that do with this. Um, but it is an effective method. I have used this before. Um, and the other nice thing is, all that the, the cardboard and everything is all going to decompose eventually. So if you wait enough time, um, you know, you can sometimes just literally just plant straight into it, um, it you know, as long as there's not in, too much like plastic or anything um, involved in there. Um, so that's kind of nice. Okay. Um, before we go to the next slide, we had one question about solarizing. Um, someone sure. wanted to know if that kills the soil microbes that are in there as well. So it can be hard on soil microbes, yes. So unfortunately, this is one of the things that we are gonna run into when you're doing this. Um, and this is exactly why I say, when you start off with this, don't don't just do it, kill things willy nilly. Because if you're killing the plants there, you're going to be doing some damage to some of the beneficial microbes and stuff that are in the soil as well. Now, the trade-off is when you get your native plants put in, they're gonna be much better for the microbial health of that soil in the long term. So it's kind of like doing a little bit of damage up front to do a lot more good over the course of the next, you know, the rest of the lifespan of your of your lawn. Um, so I don't I don't have exact numbers for you on how much damage it does. Um, I know it can be detrimental to some of the um, soil, um, you know, the soil ecosystem there, the invertebrates and stuff that live live in your soil. But unfortunately, you know, and tilling is the same way. Tilling breaks up a lot of fungal connections. Um, every method has different. Benefits, you know, some methods are are harder on certain species than others. Um, so it really just really it varies. Um, you know, there's a lot of literature on that that I can't, I would take forever to go into the too deep into it. But but yeah, it, it's not completely you know. But I we are we are killing killing things here and um, it's part part of the job. Thank you for answering that. And yes, um, I think that's kind of why we started with that slide about trade-offs. Um, mm -hmm. We always talk about how everything dealing with sustainability and conservation is really a matter of trade-offs and just trying to find the method that works best, has the least amount of impact. But 
it's very hard to pretty much do anything as humans um, without having some environmental impact. So just right. doing your best to understand what that impact is and minimizing as best you can. Um, that's really the best you can do. You minimize it and you really will see. I mean, in a few years, it's it's no question. If you compare the soil under a lawn to the soil under a native wildflower meadow or something like that, like the amount of organic matter, the amount of biodiversity in the soil is going to be so much higher. Um, so even doing a little, little bit of damage up front to get to that point, it I mean it's 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 rewarding and it is definitely worth worth the payoff once it once it gets established. Cool. And speaking of trade-offs, um, our next slide. Let's do it. <laughs> um, the dreaded herbicide. Yes. So herbicides, um, there are a tool we can use um, to kill off lawns in, in, you know, in the, in the goal of, of pursuing, um, creating more ecologically friendly options. Um, again, this is something I always want to stress. The last thing we want to be doing is continually applying herbicides for long periods of time. That's really where you get the problem with herbicide. You get buildup in the environment, you know, you see lead to all sorts of cascading effects. Um, a lot of times in agricultural fields, that's the big problem is you see, you know, it's year after year after year herbicides being used. Um, and that's really what is doing big damage to the soil. Um, now we are talking about damage to, to um, organisms in the soil. Herbicide, it is, it can be detrimental to certain species of insects and stuff, but it doesn't kill like for example, it doesn't break up fungal connections and stuff the same way that even tilling would. Um, but it is a chemical that you are introducing to the ecosystem. Um, depends on what you use. Um, most of them, well, some of them break down very quickly in the environment. So um, it may, in some scenarios, be one of the less um, damaging options. Um, but again, that's going to be for every person to decide. I'm not here to push, push herbicides on anyone. I certainly... Um, like to spray as, as little as humanly possible whenever I'm doing any any um, recovery work. Um, so a couple of tips, if you do decide to use herbicide, um, I'm just going to speak from personal experience. My most commonly used herbicide is glyphosate, which is the uh, one of the most common brand names of it is Roundup. Um, that it actually breaks down the fastest in soils compared to almost any other um, herbicide. Um, and it's really broad spectrum. So it really, it kills all plants. It, 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 the way it targets plants, it will kill pretty much any, any plant that um, it comes into contact with. Um, so if you want to wholesale remove your lawn and totally replace it, it's a good option for that. Um, one thing I do always want to mention, though, if you're using this, don't just go out and buy bottled Roundup. Because the bottle, the pre-bottled Roundup, pre-mixed Roundup has a surfactant in it. Um, that is truly lethal to these little guys we're seeing on the screen here, frogs, amphibians. Um, there's a lot, anything that any creature has, has permeable skin like that, um, if it comes into contact with these, uh, with the, it's not the herbicide itself, it's the surfactant that's mixed in with it. Um, and a surfactant is basically a chemical that is mixed in with the herbicide to make sure it spreads easily and it penetrates into the plants to get it where it wants to go. Um, so if you do use herbicide, make sure you always look for ones that have an aquatic safe surfactant. Um, they call it aquatic safe because that's where most people encounter frogs and toads and stuff. But frogs and toads can be hiding anywhere, you know, salamanders, anything like that. Like the, you know, you'd be surprised at how you'll find them in your lawn and in places that you would never think that you'd find them. So always make sure to use aquatic safe. Um, and then again, if you do use herbicides, make sure you read everything about it, you know, when you should apply it, for example, if you're using glyphosate, you have to apply it while the plants are growing. The plants have to be green. You can't apply it over the winter. It's not going to do anything. Um, and also try to really avoid applying it while there are flowering plants that are flowering. So if you want to kill off a field of, you know, ground ivy or something, um, while it's flowering, bees will visit it. And if you spray it while it's flowering, there's a short time before it dies that it's going to have that herbicide on there. And you could get that, you know, the bees are going to visit the flowers. And um, while the herbicide doesn't kill the bees, there are more studies showing that it alters their behavior and is really not good for them. Um, so try to avoid spraying um, when plants are flowering, if possible. Um, so yeah, again, trade-offs. We said trade-offs a lot. There's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, you got to think hard about what you're okay with doing um, and what you think might be the most effective option for, for you. 
Um, all right. So now we got we got finished up the uh, the part the not fun part about killing things. We need to talk about the cool stuff, which is growing things. Um, so one thing that I do like to recommend to people who are trying to do do a native planting, or you know, especially people who have a bigger area that's not just you know a small garden bed that's easily weeded and maintained. Um, I always recommend look for aggressive species. Um, if you're doing a large area, if you're doing like your whole lawn or you're doing, you know, a couple acres or something or doing any, any big area, having sp native species that are proven common aggressive species, um, it's going to save you a lot of time. They're going to want to really spread over areas um, and they're going to give you really good coverage, especially if you're using it as an actual lawn replacement and you want full ground cover. Um, really good aggressive species are, are a good thing. Um, and make sure you're choosing the right plant for your space. So, um, you know, we talk about native plants. It's important that when we say native plants, we're talking about plants that are native to your specific region. Um, so if you're living here in Virginia, um, you're going to have a specific suite of plants that are native to your region. If you're living out in the West Coast in California, it's going to be completely different. And even within Virginia, I will say that, for example, if you're living out here in the Shenandoah Valley, our soils, our plants, the things we have growing here are going to be pretty different than if you're living right on the coastal plain. You know, if you're living down in Virginia Beach or something, um, you're going to have a very different set selection of plants there. So, so go as locally native as you can, is something I always recommend. Um, as far as what aggressive plants you can choose, I mean, this, this picture here, this is a golden ragwort, Pacara aria, great evergreen native ground cover, blooms beautifully in the spring, pollinator magnet. Um, loves partial shade. So this is an example I'm giving you just because this is a plant. It is native to out most of the Eastern U United States, pretty much every state you can find this plant growing. Um, but it also, not only is it native to these regions, but it also has specific requirements. So it likes to grow in part shade. If you try to plant this plant in a totally full sun area, it's probably not gonna get gonna do too well. It might get too hot for it there or other bigger plants will come and crowd it out. Um, if you try to plant this plant in a completely, utterly shaded, um, you know, old growth forest canopy or something, um, well, actually it might do okay there. But um, in general, it's going to thrive the best in sort of a part shade area. So look up what each individual plant needs and make sure that the specific conditions of your site are right for it. Um, another thing I want to mention here is this mentions rhizome spreaders, um, which is really something interesting to think about. Um, so ideally, if you have a, a native plant habitat and it is functioning well, it has you know ecosystem functions, it is going to be propagating itself. Um, so you want plants that are going to be able to either self-seed themselves or spread by rhizomes, use other methods to kind of cover the ground um, and prevent you know those voids where invasive plants or other things that are going to make um, the management um, a huge problem. So just something to keep in mind. Um, aggressive native plants. Um, always, always here for them. I also want to, I do want to say really quick before we go on though, some people, you know, I mean, if you have a very small space and you're okay with weeding it and managing it more carefully and, you know, um, you don't want these, you know, you have a, maybe you have a bunch of other gardens and you don't want these natives seeding into your other spaces, you know, maybe that's something to consider. It might not be for everybody, but in general, um, I, I like, I like, like going, going aggressive there. All right, edible landscaping. Um, so this is something interesting. Um, this is definitely not my um, not my area of expertise. Um, I had do a, I do a little bit of vegetable gardening myself, but um, it is something to consider. Um, it's kind of cool to be able to just go out into your yard and just sort of like eat your landscaping whenever you want. Um, I like the idea of using fruit trees as focal points. Um, specifically, there are a number of actually really cool native fruit trees that are surprisingly easy to care for. Um, and, you know, you can get delicious fruits off them. Um, so pawpaws is one. If you're living down in, you know, somewhere in a more moist area with a little bit of shade, pawpaws are a great thing. Kind of suckers a lot, but they're really interesting little trees. Um, persimmon, someone in the chat said they like, plant, like love their persimmons. That's true. Native native persimmon to Virginia, uh, Diospyros virginiana. Um, that's a really good tree. The persimmons are delicious if you get them when they're perfectly ripe. Um, you know, there's 
other native things, I mean, there's little native wild strawberries you can plant. Um, you know, there are cultivated strawberries as well, but there's native wild strawberries to make a good little ground cover. Um, all sorts of really cool, cool um, edible landscaping you can do. And then, you know, there are certain annuals that you can plant. You know, you can plant your your, your leafy greens, your variegated uh, peppers. Um, I know we have a little decorative garden bed at the Arboretum where we plant fish peppers every year just because they look nice. And then you get really delicious peppers too. Um, so you can do a lot of experimenting with that. Um, just something to keep in mind if, if, if you want to kind of have that sort of edible aspect, be able to taste your, your landscaping. Um, okay, so let's talk about ground covers a little bit. Um, so I think um, a lot of people who, the, the types of people who don't want any grass at all or just want to have really nice ground covers that are going to be low, short to the ground, kind of function similarly to grass, but they won't have to mow. Um, here are some options for you. Um, this is a mix of, these aren't all native plants, I will mention. These are, this is a mix of some native and some non-native plants. Um, none of these plants are considered invasive. Um, but things like sedum, um, wild ginger, golden ragwort, um, and there are some native sedums there. Those three are really good um, native ground covers. I also want to throw uh, blue phlox into this mix, um, at least for the eastern United States. Um, I think it's, I guess they have creeping phlox over there. I'm not sure if that's what is being referenced here. But um, yeah, phlox divericata, woodland phlox, um, really, really great. Um, evergreen ground cover, and then the spring it blooms, blooms beautifully. Um, the, yeah, the wild ginger golden ragwort here, same. I have some hellebores. I have a little native uh, garden patch in my front yard, just a nice little wildflower meadow patch right in my front yard, very small. I live in a city. Um, but I have all natives, except I also have a few hellebores in there because I've got a soft spot for them. I think the flowers are nice. And honestly, they bloom before any native plants bloom. They're blooming in early March. Um, they're blooming in February sometimes. Um, so it does kind of extend that bloom window a little bit, which is nice. Um, yeah, okay, can move on from there. Um, okay, so the no mow grass. Um, so this is a thing that started to become more popular. Um, you're seeing some seed places online and various nurseries starting to promote um, seed mixtures of no mow grasses. Um, so there are native grasses that you can plant that generally grow pretty low to the ground and are pretty easy maintenance. They don't require a lot of mowing. Um, so some of the natives are listed here. Of course, these are natives to the eastern United States at least. I'm not sure if they're all native across the country um, or in other countries, but um, definitely just worth doing some research on that. Um, there are other mixes, fescue mixes. Some are part native, um, but you know, very shade tolerant. Um, I do want to mention sedges here. Sedges are super cool. Um, I actually have I've seen some 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 areas of in like especially in shady areas um, there's a lot of really good native sedges which sedges kind of look a lot like grasses but the flowers I think are much prettier um, and there are really there are some caterpillars and stuff that do specialize in some of these native grasses and native sedges um, so they are you know while it is just low grass it's not providing a lot of pollen or nectar or big flowers for any pollinators um, they will um, there are many species of insects that actually will you know, specialize and eat a lot of these native grasses. Um, one other thing to mention about these grasses, though, is that if you're going for a real true no mow grass, it's not really doesn't stand up as much as a regular lawn. Um, so you're not going to be wandering around, running around out there playing frisbee on it all the time. Um, you know, really heavy heavy foot traffic and stuff is will start to tear it up. So just something to keep in mind. It can kind of give you the look of a of a grass without having to mow, um, but. It's not going to hold up quite as well. You can still walk on it, you know, sometimes. Well, um, clover. Uh, so clover is something that I kind of actually like. Um, I have some section of my lawn that, um, you know, it's grass. And when I It was grass when I got the house, when I moved in, um, and there's clover and stuff in it. And the clover, I'm happy, I'm happy to have. I, I let it go. Um, it's holds up to stepping pretty well. You can stand on it pretty well. It's not a native plant. I do want to say it's not a native plant. However, it provides a lot of nectar um, for visiting pollinators. Um, bees really like it. Um, so 
it is actually a pretty decent plant to have in your in, in your lawn and it's also super super easy to maintain it really requires no more than regular grass i mean if you have a lawn and you're not super picky about herbiciding it and stuff you probably get clover just popping up in there um so that is one option um it's also a legume so it fixes nitrogen to the soil um which is always nice um for helping build that build the the nutrients in the in your soil there um and yeah holds up to holds up to walking okay all right so here are some plants that i would generally avoid um so when you start looking to replacing your lawn and really growing green um you start seeing a lot of people are um you know a lot of sources pushing some of these species as good species to plant i would generally say no to most of them so english ivy japanese honeysuckle these are vines that are wildly invasive in the united states i mean there are certain towns that i've seen that are just absolutely overrun with um english ivy you know if it people start planting it suddenly it escapes into woodlots and then every tree is smothered in english ivy and it just kills smothers everything else out definitely don't want that um for me anytime i see that in my lawn that is a kill on site i pull that up immediately um same thing with japanese honeysuckle it's a big problem um, other ones that I would generally avoid that people do like to market as good alternative ground covers, you know, anti-lawn ground covers are vinca. So vinca is periwinkle. You probably heard it called periwinkle. Um, that is not native, not very useful for, useful to, to many pollinators and really, really hard to get rid of once it's established. It is, It just stays there. Um, I always say that blue phlox I mentioned earlier, great alternative does the same thing. It's evergreen, creeps along the ground, beautiful flowers in the spring, but not nearly as bad. And it actually provides good wildlife habitat. Uh, Pachysandra. So we're talking about Japanese Pachysandra specifically. Um, that's a big problem. Again, one of those things that once it's planted, it's it will spread and it will take over everything and it will be very, very hard to remove. Um, there is a... a a pachysandra that is native to, I think, like Kentucky and Tennessee. There's just a pretty small area here in the eastern United States called um, Allegheny pachysandra, which you might consider. Um, it's not doesn't have a broad range in the wild, but it does. Um, there are some native pollinators that use it, and in my experience, it's not nearly as aggressive um, or sort of doesn't tend to take over nearly as much as the Japanese pachysandra. Um, a few things I mentioned here, um, this volunteer section in the middle is something that I that I like to mention um, simply because these are plants that a lot like clover, sometimes you'll just see coming up in your yard. You'll see the little false strawberries showing up, which are not the same as our native wild strawberries. These are not edible, whereas the native wild strawberries are actually very tasty. Um, and things like ground ivy or creeping charlie will just creep into areas, you know, uh, purple dead nettle, head and bit, and other, other ones. Um, these are species that I like to call, I don't know if I would straight up call them invasive, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I guess you could, but um, there may be some certain scenarios in which it is okay to leave them, I would say. Um, they do tend to spread, they can see themselves, they spread by rhizomes, but if you have a lawn that you are, you know, mowing, keeping in check, and you're not, and you know, especially if you're in like an urban area or something like that, um, you know, having them in there, they they work as a fine ground cover. You know, like the, the, they're not going to, you know, they are pretty short lived. Um, they're not going to, in generally, in good intact forest ecosystems and native habitats, they're not a huge problem. They really only show up in areas that humans are constantly tropping around in, disturbing. Um, that's kind of their niche. Um, so I'm not really too worried about those escaping into the wild, into the you know our, our nice um, native habitats and taking over. Um, but just something to consider. I don't know. You know, it's double-edged sword. All right, talking a little bit about winter so seed sowing here. Um, so. Figure it's good to probably good to mention this just because we are in the winter time. Um, I know we're all getting anxious to start planting our gardens and start doing stuff. Um, and I know it's this. I mean, especially for me, like waiting from now between now and like April is like the hardest part because I'm just like bursting with all these ideas for the coming year. Um, one thing you consider doing is actually starting to sow some of your seeds that you might want to plant plants you might want to plant right now in the winter time. Um, so if you want to be planting individual natives or something, um, 
a lot of almost all native plants, especially native wildflowers, are going to require a period of cold stratification. Um, so cold stratification, what we mean by that is it just needs to sit basically in cold, wet um, conditions like it would in nature for at least a month or two um, before it will even consider germinating. So if you just try to get these plants from the dealer and throw them in the ground in the spring, a lot of them won't germinate until the following year. Um, so one thing you can do is you need to go out and just seed your ground right now if you have an area prepped with all the grass dead. Um, just seed it right now in the winter. It's a great time to do it. Or you can do like this little handy graphic does says and do it in a milk jug. Um, and that's a really great way to start a bunch of plants. And then you come out in the spring and they'll be growing. You'll be ready to transplant them into bigger and better pastures throughout your lawn. Um, so, yeah. Is there anything in particular you'd like to add to winter seed sowing uh, with the gallon jugs, Hannah? I know this is very much your yeah. forte. You taught me how to do it at like my <laughs> first Sustainability Matters event. I don't know about my forte, but it definitely um, is, it meets my requirements of um, being uh, a great lazy way to start native plants. Um, it, you know, it, it takes advantage of mother nature's natural signals to not need to do that um, cold moist stratification in your fridge for several weeks to get that signal of I'm cold. It also, um, you know, Blandy had a great post on, on Facebook today about, hey, we've got snow. One great way to seed in the winter is to go spread seed right on the snow and let it melt down in. Um, and that's great, A, if you already have a site kind of cleared and prepped. Um, but also I tend to do that and then nothing sprouts because the birds ate it all or it all washed away. Um, so when it's it's something that I really want to make sure gets kind of a head start and I can nurture it a little bit um, and then plant it purposefully somewhere on a small scale, I love winter so seed sowing because it uses that um, the cold winter to to give that signal of oh I've made it through the winter it's spring now we can grow um, but it also um, has the benefit of not needing like expensive seed starting mats and lights it doesn't take up space inside um, you just throw them in these containers you throw them outside make sure that they're staying moist so you have it open at the top to allow rain and snow to come in. We have drainage holes at the bottom, um, but it still produces these nice hardy little seeds that have been exposed to the elements. So you don't have to harden them off before you take the seedlings out. Um, and I love that you can reuse materials that you have on hand. So, you know, the, the gallon milk jugs is kind of the iconic winter sewing container, but I've used all sorts of things. Um, I saw in the chat, two liter soda bottles totally can do that. Um, if you have old plastic totes that you're, you know, would otherwise be getting rid of even with cracks and things like that, you know, pop some drainage holes in the bottom and put either plant pots or um, I've like saved my fast food cups from uh, McDonald's and Burger King and pop some holes in the bottom of those and lined them up in a tote. As long as it will hold three to four inches of soil depth and then give you a couple inches for plant growth, you can have holes in the top and the bottom. Um, then you're you're pretty much good to go. Um, I've used Ziploc baggies, even the big gallon size Ziploc bags that I've saved from random things because I hate throwing plastic away. Uh, fill that again with four inches of soil, put some drainage in the bottom. Um, basically, I put like chopsticks through the top to make them stand up. And that was actually one of my most successful um, winter sowing methods. So there's lots of different ways to do this. Uh, some seeds work better with it than others. Um, if you're having a really dry winter, you may need to uh, to go out and moisten it if it's not frozen. If, if you're above freezing and it's dry, you may need to make sure your soil is staying moist. Um, but other than that, it's pretty simple. Uh, and I love a, a, a lazy method that produces good results. Um, and if you're in the Winchester area, we're going to be having a winter seed sowing um, event at Jim Barnett Park next month. Um, and I think we'll have those dates on the slide in a little bit. So I hope you'll join us for that. Yes, and that's a great point. Please do not go out and buy like a gallon jug um, and dump out all of the milk just because <laughs> you want to use the gallon jug. Um, like if you're a plant-based milk person like me, um, I just called Starbucks, um, asked if they had any leftover gallon jugs. And a lot of the time they are more than happy to give them to you because they are either going to be recycling them or throwing them away. Um, so always be looking for ways to reuse materials that you already have. Um, or find a way to source stuff from other people instead of just 
buying more plastic because that is the entire thing that we're trying to avoid here. Yeah, um, and I see a question in the chat about the storage bins. Are they just to help move the pots around? For me, they were to help keep the little the little pots from blowing or like animals getting into them. Um, but you can totally come up with whatever. I've seen people like put them between cinder box or boards or, you know, um, find what works for you. Because the bins do definitely break down in the weather, which is why I would only use old ones and not buy them myself for that purpose specifically, because they're not going to last more than a couple seasons. Fantastic. And ha that is our last slide. So as Hannah mentioned, our next slide is a little bit of information about some upcoming events that we have. Um, she mentioned the winter seed sowing event at Jim Barnett Park in Winchester on February 10th. That is a Saturday. I believe we're starting at 1 p.m. Um, and there'll be a bunch of materials for you guys to be able to create your own um, gallon jugs. And we'll also be giving a preview of the native meadow that we are installing at Jim Barnett Park. And we are very, very excited about that. Hopefully we'll be planting it sometime in the spring or early summer. We will also be having two presentations at the VAEE conference, which is Virginia Environmental Education, I believe. Um, we will be speaking about our Making Trash Bloom project, as well as utilizing social media in environmental education. So if you are an environmental educator, you probably already know about this conference, but if not, um, be sure to check it out. There's a lot of awesome speakers and great presentations for you. Um, and then on February 26th, we will be having our next webinar, Conscious Cooking, which is all about minimizing waste in the kitchen. Um, over 40% of the U.S. food supply ends up in the landfills, and we are going to do our best to educate you guys about how we can minimize that waste, um, both for food and the single-use packaging that we often see um, in the kitchen. So with that, um, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, and please help us thank Jack and Hannah in the chat for lending us their time and expertise on this subject. Um, I learned so much. Um, I have a much bigger appreciation for bees, I think, now more than anything. Um, Hannah really drilled that into me at the beginning. So I very, very much appreciate that. Um, and I'm actually going to drop a poll right now. If you guys wouldn't mind filling that out before you head out, um, this just gives us a little bit more information about what you guys enjoyed from this webinar, um, and it will help us bring you guys better material going forward to make sure we are covering the things that you guys are most interested in. Um, and if you did find any of the information you learned today useful, um, please consider making a donation to Sustainability Matters to help us continue bringing you webinars like this, um, as well as our other projects like Making Trash Bloom and Ecologigals. Um, we really just appreciate your support as much as possible. And if you aren't able to support us financially, you can still support us by completely ripping up your lawn, any section of your lawn, and planting some natives. Um, since you guys are at this webinar, I'm sure you guys are already well on your way to doing that. So thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you guys so much for really just honoring Sari Carp's legacy with this native planting. Um, it is actually Sari's birthday, so it was really coincidental that we're talking about native plants and creating native habitats. Um, on her birthday. So thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you guys for keeping Sustainability Matters alive and supported. Um, all of your support means the absolute world to us, and we really just can't thank you guys enough. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and end the webinar. You will be sent a recording of this in your email tomorrow, and that will be available for a week, and then it will go up on our YouTube channel to live indefinitely. Um, and we'll also send some other resources in there as well. So thank you guys so much for taking your time today, and we will see you at the next webinar, hopefully.